الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اما بعد I start by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing us to all gather here today in this masjid and the masjid is the most beloved place to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the masjid is Baytu Kulli Taqi it is the home of every righteous pious person we thank Allah Azza wa for blessing Ahl al-Islam Ahl al-Sunnah with regards to the growth and the spread of the da'wah, alhamdulillah, the last time I was here was approximately 2010. 14 years ago. And alhamdulillah, to see the growth of the community and the development is a blessing. And it's always good, brothers and sisters, that likewise we talk about the positive things. Because all of us have a role. Every single one of us has a role in trying to better our own selves firstly and foremostly but also bettering our communities because we live in our communities. And as we know Allah fi'awni al-'ab ma kana al-'abdu fi'awni akhihi. Allah will aid the servant as much as the servant they aid their brother. The Muslim wants good for the people. Yes, the non-Muslim to be guided and the Muslim that has errors or deviation to return to the truth and what is correct. We want good for everyone. And that's why we're here today. We are gathered because we want to help one another go to paradise. May Allah Azza bless us all with paradise. But we know that path is a path that requires effort and sacrifice as paradise has been surrounded by difficulty and the hellfire is surrounded by lusts and desires but for the one that strives for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal the reward is great in this life and in the hereafter and today for my talk I'm going to discuss a hadith in Sahih Muslim and this hadith highlights to us that it's about paradise and trying to get to paradise and escape the punishment of hell. And the companions, they aided one another to do this because they wanted good for one another. And the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught them the path that leads to al-jannah. It is the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And paradise, brothers and sisters, is something that as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said that Allah Azzawajalli said in the hadith Qudsi, to, I prepared for my righteous servants that which no eye has seen, witnessed nor any ear has heard about paradise is better than anything that we can imagine anything to the extent that in the hereafter an individual will be brought and he will be from the poorest of the people of this world but he's from Ahl al-Jannah he's from the people of paradise and he will be dipped into paradise he'll just have a taste of it and it will, it will be said to him, did you experience any difficulty, any hardship? And he will say, no, my Lord. Look, he has a taste of paradise. He was from the poorest of the people of this world. But when he has a taste of Jannah, he will be asked, did you go through anything difficult in the world? He will say, no, nothing difficult. Because once you, when you reach Jannah, may Allah bless us all with paradise. And no one will enter paradise except the one who dies upon a tawheed. 
unrighteous actions are a means to enter paradise and the people they will enter paradise by the mercy of Allah Azzawajal. if a person enters paradise they'll forget everything else that's for eternity lasts forever so when we hear whoever does such and such whoever builds a masjid Allah Azzawajal will build for them a house in paradise for the believer when they hear that I will get a house in paradise Whoever prays 12 rak'ah in a day from the supererogatory prayers, they will get a house in paradise. I will get a house in paradise. That's what it's about. Because if you look at it, Ikhwan, this world is something in reality. Naam, it's temporary. Whatever we have, all of us, the richest from amongst us, the poorest from amongst us, whatever we have right now is temporary. It's never going to last. You don't truly own it. Allah Azza wa owns everything. Because when you depart from this world, whatever car you drive is going to somebody, someone else. Whatever house you own, someone else is going to live in it. Whatever you have of this dunya, it's temporarily yours. But what is with Allah Azza is baq. It remains, lasts forever. And we will see this in this hadith. Look at the companions. Look how they behaved. How they interacted with the dunya. All of these things in this beautiful hadith. Handala radiallahu anhi said, لَقِيَنِي أَبُو بَكَرْ Abu Bakr, he met me. And he said, كَيْفَ أَنْتَ يَا حَنْضَلَ How are you, O oh Hanzala? Hanzala, he said, قُلْتُ I said, نَافَقَ حَنْضَلَ Hanzala has fallen into hypocrisy. Look, the companions, they feared hypocrisy of action for themselves. They weren't amazed with themselves. The companions were the best of mankind after the prophets and the messengers, but they weren't amazed by themselves. They didn't look down upon the people. They didn't say, they didn't have their nose in the sky looking down upon the people. He said, Nafaka Handala. Handala has fallen into hypocrisy. So look, Nam, they didn't look down on anyone. He looked at his own soul. That is why, regardless of what level of piety we think we have reached, or how much knowledge we think we have, whether you're the Imam of the Masjid that's memorized the Quran, or just whoever you are, the Muslim never looks down on anyone. Arrogance is what? Arrogance is you reject the truth and you look down upon the people. The people should never sense from you arrogance. The believer is humble. Humility. So, Handala, he said, Nafaka Handala. And Ibn Abi Mulaika, he said, I met 30 of the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All of them feared hypocrisy for themselves, meaning hypocrisy of actions. Look, they feared for themselves because tomorrow's not guaranteed for any of us brothers and sisters. We don't know what's going to happen to any of us tomorrow. We do not know what's going to happen. We don't know where we're going to end up, but actions are judged based on their endings. You have a good ending, you die upon Tawheed, you're guaranteed Jannah. So it's about the ending. How are we going to end? Yes, we may have individuals from amongst us, they have pasts. Everyone has a past. That doesn't determine who we have to be right now or who we can be in the future because we can all change. And look at the companions. The companions, many of them, they accepted Al Islam. After the period of Al-Jahiriyyah. And the companions are the best of mankind after the prophets and the messengers. So Handala, he said, Nafaka Handala. Handala has fallen into hypocrisy. Meaning of actions. Abu Bakr, he said, Subhanallah, ma taqul. He said, exalted is Allah, I'm free of all imperfections. What are you saying? That's ta'ajub, he was amazed. Also, tabriya wa tanzih, meaning... He, don't, he didn't know him to be like that. He said, what are you saying? Look, the companions, they love one another for the sake of Allah. They were honest. They were truthful to Allah and they were honest with one another. They didn't talk behind each other's backs. They had advice. They said it to each other. They were men, real men. Being a man is not just about muscles. Firstly, a man, if we want to know what manhood is, read the Quran. How many times Allah mentions rijal, the men are in the masjid. Sifat of Rijal. It's not a, anyone can claim with their tongue. That's easy. And Allah is going to test all of us at different situations and different predicaments. But Sabat is, starts with firmness of your heart. Look, Abu Bakr, he said, Subhanallah, what are you saying, Hamdala? They were brothers. They loved each other. 
In one narration, it mentions that he was crying. When he found him, Abu Bakr, he said, What's wrong with you, Hanzala? He said, Nafaka Hanzala. So then he said, Qultu Hanzala, he said, Nakunu inda Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Yudhakiruna bin nari wal janna ka anna ra'ya'in. He said, When we're with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he reminds us about the hellfire and paradise as if we see it with our own eyes. Look at the gatherings of the Prophet alayhi salatu It was about paradise and hell. Reminding them about paradise, targhib, encouraging them with good deeds to earn paradise, the promise of Allah azza wa jalla al jannah for the believers, those who do righteous deeds. Also, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam would frighten them. He said, "You the kiruna bin nar targhib, warning them of the punishment of Allah." Look. How our da'wah, yes, we give encouragement and we scare people. Likewise, na'am, if you see people falling into sin, yes, you mention about the punishment of Allah Azza wa Jal, tabarak wa ta'ala. But also encouragement, targheeb wa targheeb. Encouragement, the promise of Allah Azza wa Jal, jannah, and also fear. With regards to the punishment of Allah Azza wa Jal, the hellfire. He said, it's as if we see it with our own eyes. Look at the level of yaqeen. What's the levels of yaqeen, brothers and sisters, if we look at the Quran? Certainty. That's the level of the companions. That is why when they heard ayat promising paradise about certain things, they were the first and foremost running towards it. Because it was certain. And this is the level of certainty. They said when we were with the Messenger of Allah and he would remind us about paradise and the hellfire, it's as if we witnessed and we saw paradise and we saw hell with our own eyes. What level of certainty is this? And what are the levels of certainty? Anyone? What are the level of certainties? The level of certainty in the Quran? Fadl. Fadl. I'm sure many of you have the answer. Fadl. What's the lowest and what's the highest? Akhtaat. Uh, he had the three, but he had the lowest rung. So he said, he said, ilm al yaqeen, ayn al yaqeen, haq al yaqeen. What's the levels? Which is the lowest, which is the highest? Fadl. Ilm al yaqeen, knowledge of certainty is the lowest. Ayn al yaqeen, certainty of sight. Haq al yaqeen, absolute certainty because of experience. What level of certainty is this? That the companions they said, "Kaanna ra'yain, ain al yaqeen." It says if they were seeing it. I'll give an example so we understand it better. If I said, say for example, or if we had a trustworthy, the brother, a trustworthy individual said, "I have an apple and the apple is delicious," and he's trustworthy. Okay, we say yes, we have certainty. A trustworthy brother told us the apple is delicious. The brother he said he pulled out the apple. The apple looked like it was a red, nice, delicious apple. That's Ayn al yaqeen We see the delicious apple. He gives me the apple. I take a bite. I say, yes, that apple was delicious. That is Haq al yaqeen So that's what the people of Jannah will experience. May Allah bless us with paradise. But look at the level of the companions. It, is, it was as if we saw paradise and as if we saw the fire of hell. He said, فَإِذَا خَرَجْنَ مِنْ عِنْدِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, he said, but when we departed from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He said, but when we left the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, and we play with our wives and we play with our children and we attend to our business, our worldly affairs, we forget much. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, for wallahi inna lanalqa mithl He said, by Allah, we experience the same thing that you experience. So what did they do? Look, Alhamdulillah, he said, in talaqtu ana wa Abu Bakr, hatta dakhalna ala Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, me and Abu Bakr, we went until we entered upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A benefit of this as well, ikhwan, when we want to talk about paradise and the hellfire, it's based upon Quran and Sunnah, not just stories. It's not just about sitting down and telling people beautiful stories. It's not stories. After stories, what do you have then? No, the da'wah of the Prophet was Quran and Sunnah. If that's not going to move a person, nothing will. After those stories, then what? 
if you know in our time some people they take on the approach all they're going to do is sit in front of you and tell you stories about the road anyone who's been on the road they could they know about the road you don't have to tell stories all day about that and from my experience meeting people who are in that life they don't like to glorify it those people who are about it they don't like to glorify that life it's people that weren't really in it that like to glorify it because there's nothing good about the road nothing good about the streets it's satanic shaitan the music the drug culture shaitan the streets, the killing, shaitan. Any coward can kill. Any coward can pull a trigger. Anyone. Anyone. And I'm talking from the community that we're in in America. It happens. That's real life. I've picked up people with their brains on my shoulder. It's not brave that you kill someone. Anyone can kill someone. And it's amazing because the people who are really in that life, many of them are coming to Islam. Many of them. People that are respected citywide. Not just in their little area, not pretending people that live that life, they're coming to Islam and the Sunnah. Alhamdulillah, some of them, they make, they make Umrah, they go to the Dorat of the scholars, Alhamdulillah, and they love the Kitab and the Sunnah. They're leaving that life. I speak to brothers in the federal system. The Muslims are respected even in the federal system in America, in the prisons. Especially Ahl Sunnah, the Salafis. Brothers who are renowned in that system. People who are in it, there's brothers that alhamdulillah they left that life they don't glorify it and they've lived it what do they respect now they respect quran and sunnah with the understanding of the self of the ummah they respect knowledge and the people of knowledge because they know that that is a wicked life so if you want to remind people about paradise and the hellfire we don't just go out telling stories all day yes you can tell someone your story there's nothing wrong so that you can relate listen i come from the same place that you came from nothing wrong with that but after that then what we're going to teach you quran and sunnah because that is what nurtured the companions the Prophet والسلام, he nurtured the companions with the book of Allah, جل, the revelation of Allah and the Sunnah, which was also revelation, not stories. Ikhwan, we're trying to build communities. We can't build communities just with camera moments and Instagram influences. After the camera, then what? Then what? So look, he said, Abu Bakr said, Wallahi, by Allah, I, we experience exactly what you experience. And they said, let's go to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look how the companions want to good for each other. Come, let us go as brothers. We're going to ask the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Because we all want good for each other. We want to aid one another. Get to Jannah. Your brother has a mistake, advise them. Your sister has a shortcoming, advise them. If it's private, private. If it's public, yes. If there's a public error, we're going to respond to it publicly. So that the religion of Allah is preserved. Because the religion of Allah is the most precious thing. Don't get in your feelings. If your error is cl clarified and it was public, no one's above being corrected. From the primary objectives of Islam is what? The first is hifz the deen, preservation of the religion. If somebody is trying to distort the religion, it needs to be clarified if it's public. The companions look, they wanted good for one another. They wanted paradise for one another. And it was genuine. That's why when they were on the battlefield, they had no fear. My brother's next to me. I, I don't have to worry. He's not going to run away. I don't have to worry. Whether we win or whether we're defeated, he's going to be right next to me. How many of us can say that, that you're confident that the person is going to be there right next to you? I say in America, you know one thing, when I speak to the brothers, alhamdulillah, that we, for example, we go and we visit in the different communities and areas. The people that a lot of people look up to and they say, you know, this person was in the street, this person was this, this person was that. How many of them end up informers and snitches and rats? Not even loyal to the code that they believe in. It's all fake. Because when they stand before that judge, yes sir, no sir. I don't respect anyone. You get in that courtroom, you respect the judge. It's all fake. It's facade. It's a joke. All from the shaitan. Good illusion. Reality. There's no reality to it. What's real? What is real is what we find in the book of Allah and the son of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And that's why we say alhamdulillah. In America we have many. We don't look down upon our brothers. Many of the brothers came out of prison. Some of them are the best brothers in our community in terms of what they're giving back. Yes, and we have brothers. Don't get confused. That's not, not only our community. <laughs> we have doctors. We have, you know, professionals. We have people that have never been to prison. But we have all walks of life. We don't look down on anyone. Every, all of us have a role. Because we can all relate to different people. And we respect people based upon knowledge and based upon implementation. Anzil al nas manazilahum, putting people in the station that they deserve. Havidukumullah. Even when the brother, one of the brothers who recently became Muslim, the boxer, may Allah guide us and him and grant us all firmness, 
Even that, it was amazing. That story, how he embraced Al-Islam. The brother, Abdul Haq Big Dirk, we were in Philadelphia for a seminar. We had a seminar, Talat al usul just to show the dynamics of our community. Like I said, we have Quran teachers who are doctors. We have other brothers involved who are other professionals. But also we have other brothers, alhamdulillah, who have come home, who contribute to the community. It's not too late. Everyone has a role. So Abdul Haq Big Dirk, he was in Philadelphia, another brother under admin Isa. We had a call. We want you to come down and talk to the brother. Give da'wah. Tayyib, barakallahu feek. But like we're in the middle of a conference. You know, we had a conference, I think it was from Friday to Sunday. We're in the middle of a big seminar, one of the biggest seminars in the U.S. People from all over America coming, alhamdulillah. But bismillah, you know, Abdul Haq, Big Dirk, he says, listen, it's an opportunity, let's go. So we woke up. Maryland's like about uh, two hours, give or take. So we drove down, alhamdulillah. He told us his story, how he embraced Islam. That was beneficial as well. You know, the benefits of that story. So alhamdulillah, we got there. We're in a restaurant. Just to give you an understanding. So alhamdulillah, it's the brother from the admin. We have Abdul Haq, the brother Big Dirk, myself. And there's the brother, the boxer, and there's, you know, his trainer. And there's like other people. We're in the restaurant. So we're there for like, I'd say like an hour. And his, one of his, you know, the people that he grew up with, the brother Jalil. So alhamdulillah, it's an opportunity for da'wah. So it's da'wah, alhamdulillah, the people in the restaurant, they're listening. It's just about tawheed. Listen, Islam is the only thing that's going to change ourselves and our communities. We need Islam. Islam doesn't need us. So we're there, alhamdulillah, talking about Islam, talking about the excellence of Tawheed, the excellence of the Sunnah, how it can change your life and all of us need it because even if you have money but you don't have Iman, it's not going to benefit you. If you have money but you don't have your intellect and Islam will help you protect your sanity, money without sanity is no benefit, your health, ila akhirihi, your soul. Alhamdulillah, at the end of it, Abdul Haqi goes, you know, we, we finish speaking. He's like, let's go to the masjid and pray. We can't just leave it here. So again, alhamdulillah, me, the, Abdul Haqi was like, let's go. We're going to pray in the masjid. So the brother was like, yeah, we're going to pray in the masjid. That's when he took his shahada. And like I said, Abdul Haqi is from Chicago. They're just showing you, alhamdulillah, the logistic of things. And even in Chicago, there's masajid in Chicago. I don't know if you know. Chicago, even there's, Chicago is a gang city. And there's a lot of gang ties and allegiances. But even there's Masaji, we went to certain inner cities, what they call as hoods or ghettos. People that are respected, alhamdulillah, or were respected before from these gangs, left them and upon the sunnah, even in these communities. Jeff Ford, if any of you have heard of him, he's a Muslim now. His son, they have a masjid, Masjid al ummiin We went to there. So look, these individuals, they're running away from that life. Like alhamdulillah, look. Like we are commanded to run away from those things. And they're trying to the best of their ability to work in pleasing Allah as we did. Like we see in this hadith. So they went to the Prophet ﷺ, sincere brotherhood. Being honest, I want good for you as my brother, as my sister. Let's go to the Messenger of Allah so we can get some benefit from him. How do we, this feeling that we feel that we're falling into hypocrisy because when we are with the Prophet ﷺ, and he reminds us about paradise and the hellfire, it's as if we see it with our eyes, but when we leave him, we tend to our wives and our children and we tend to our businesses or our jobs. So alhamdulillah, he said, Qultu, I said, Ya Rasulullah, nafaka alhamdulillah. I said, oh messenger of Allah, alhamdulillah has fallen into hypocrisy. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, Wa ma Why do you say that? What, what's the reason for this? Why do you feel that you've fallen into hypocrisy? Now look as well, Abu Bakr, not only alhamdulillah, Abu Bakr, you know, the first of the men to accept Al-Islam, the best of mankind after the prophets and the messengers, Abu Bakr even said, we experienced the same thing as you. He feared hypocrisy of action for himself. If he felt like that, what about any of us sitting here? That is why from the supplications that the prophet ﷺ would say the most, Ya muqallib al thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Changer of hearts, make my heart firm upon your religion because the heart can change. One day a person could be upon what is correct, the next day their heart May Allah protect us from deviation and misguidance, they go astray. So the Prophet would say frequently, O changer of hearts, make my heart firm upon your religion. Naam. So look, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, after hearing it, he said, why do you say that? What's the reason? Why do you think that you've fallen into hypocrisy? Again, he repeated, Hamdallah said, Nakunu indak, when, you're, when we are in your presence, to the kiruna bil jannati wal nar, to the kiruna bil nari wal jannah, you remind us about the hellfire and paradise, 
And it says, if we see paradise under hellfire with our own eyes. But when we leave you, again, we tend to our wives, we play with them and our children, and we take care of our business. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And look, ikhwan, the benefit of that, even if you work, you can still sacrifice for the sake of Allah. You can still seek knowledge. Look, you can't just say, you know, I work, I'm busy. The companions, they weren't busy, they didn't work. Yes, and there's nothing wrong with working, but that should not become your only life. We have a purpose. Every day we wake up, we have a purpose to fulfill. And we know our purpose. To worship Allah Azza wa Jal alone without any partners. That's our purpose. When you know that, it's bigger than just work. We're not robots. Yes, working is part of it. And we work so we could take care of our families, so that we could take care of our responsibilities. And also, if we become rich, so that we can benefit the ummah, build schools, masajid, give the needy, the poor, and so on and so forth. It's not selfishness. Yes, if you're rich, nothing, enjoy your money. The hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, how excellent, how excellent is lawful wealth for a righteous person. You can be rich, nothing wrong with it, if it's in a halal way. But it's not just about being rich. Again, there's still a bigger goal. We, we have a purpose to worship Allah azza wa jalla alone without any partners, to worship Him, to please Him, to strive for His sake. It's bigger than just amassing money. After that, then what? Look at these people because, look, it's not just about amassing money or becoming famous. Look at the YouTuber last week who committed suicide. May Allah protect us all from that. Committed suicide. Another star committed suicide. Two, it was all in the news. It pops up on the Apple feed. Suicide. Alarming rates of suicide from and drug addiction. Overdoses from fentanyl, from people who are rich and famous. Many of them are addicted to it now, and you just don't know about it. Because they don't know their purpose. They don't know their purpose. But us, we're servants of Allah. We are servants of Allah. Ibad al-Rahman, alladheena yamshuna ala al-ardi hawna. Walk on the earth with humility. Yes, you, we try and better ourselves so we can be the best version of us because Islam should make us better, obviously, human beings. But the more we implement the religion, no doubt, Iman increases and decreases. The more a person implements belief in the heart, Iman, statement of the tongue, actions of the limbs, increases with obedience, decreases with disobedience. The more righteous deeds, the more the Iman increases. So yes, there's nothing wrong with working, but that's not an excuse. Still, you seek knowledge. You give time for the akhirah. Look, there's a time for this and a time for that, as we will hear in the hadith. So when they said that to the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. When, listen, when he listened to Handala and he said, Handala has fallen into hypocrisy. When we're with you, a messenger of Allah, it says, and you remind us about the hellfire and paradise, it says, if we see it with our own eyes, when we leave you and we play with our wives and we tend to them, and our children, and we take care of our business, we forget a lot. The Messenger of Allah, وسلم, he said, he said, I swear by him, in whose hand is my soul. In law tadumuna, ala ma takununa indi, wa fi dhikri, لسافحتكم الملائكة على فرشكم وفي طرقكم لكن يا حنظلة ساعة ساعة وساعة He said the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم he said I swear by him in whose hand is my soul he said if you were to remain upon the state that you are in when you are in my presence meaning when the prophet is reminding them about paradise and the hellfire if you were to remain on that state of remembering Allah جل, whether you're on your bed or whether you're in the pathways the angels would shake your hands he said but there's an hour for this and there is an hour for that again this shows the excellence of the remembrance of Allah جل, Allah. it's a protection the remembrance of Allah. Allah bi dhikri Allah With the remembrance of Allah, the heart is content. Remembering Allah. The heart is content. Those gatherings where Allah is mentioned, 
where you seek knowledge. They are gatherings of sakina. Allah will send down sakina. Tranquility for those who attend them. The ones who remember Allah Azza wa Jal. That's why the ulama, they said, they said the dhikr of Allah to the heart is like the relationship between fish and water. If you take a fish out of water, it will die. Like that's the heart. The heart needs the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal. Yes, the remembrance of Allah. Showing the excellence of remembering Allah Azza wa Jal. He said, "In lo ala ma indi." If you remain upon that state, thinking about hellfire and paradise to this level, and upon dhikr, yes, you will be in a lofty station. But there's an hour for this and an hour for that. That's not hypocrisy. Yes, take care of your worldly affairs. All of us in the West, we take care. Go out and work, do your business, but don't let that overcome you and distract you from the commands of Allah. There's no excuse for any of us not praying. There's no excuse for any of us not praying. Praise the connection between the servant and their Lord. The one who doesn't pray has no Islam. Like Umar radiallahu anhu he said, Al-ahd al-ladhi baynana wa baynahum as salah The covenant between us and them is the prayer. Man taraka faqad kafar. You leave it, you disbelieve. There's no Islam for the one who doesn't pray. That's the relationship between the servant and their Lord. So there's no excuse for not praying. Whether you're in university, school, wherever you are. If you preserve your five daily prayers, كَانَ لَهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَهْدًا أَنْ يُدْخِلُهُ الْجَنَّةِ There's a promise with Allah, Allah will enter you into paradise. If you preserve those five. So yes, take care of your worldly affairs, take care of your families. Yes, play with your wives, alhamdulillah, spend time with them. Give your family what they need. But at the same time, there's also time for you working for the akhirah. For the men, we go to the masjid. The masjid, barakallahu feekum, is, it is the pillar of the community. That's the masjid. The masjid is the pillar of the community. That's where everything else is around the masjid. Like Medina, when the Prophet ﷺ, when they migrated from Mecca to Medina, one of the first things they did was what? Establish the masjid. That's why they call us and they say, you know, let's go out and demonstrate. Okay, you go out and demonstrate, you have a million people. Then we go to Fajr and there's one line. So who's going to give victory? It comes from you, this million, or it comes from Allah? Allah's going to give us victory and we're not even going to the masjid to pray prayer. Look how superficial it becomes. That's because those things are easy. My thing is, okay, tayyib, khalas. These people, oh, you, no doubt, Palestine, every Muslim is invested in it. Every Muslim, no doubt. 30, approximately 30,000 people have lost their lives. Around 10,000 children. Any human being, it should pain their heart. The only person who's not moved by that is a devil, a shaitan. And anyone who doesn't say that a ceasefire should be called for and implemented right now is complicit. You have blood on your hands, whether you agree with it or not. You have, blood, you have bloody hands. That's obvious to us, for the Muslims. But again, how are we going to change that? How are we going to repair it? Is it through your strength? Is it through numbers? No, we're billions. Fastest growing religion on the earth. The brothers in Philadelphia, they just told me this Friday, I think it was, six or seven people embraced Islam just in our masjid this, this Friday. Fast as going religion. It's not just about numbers. Victory, success, it comes from Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal, wa Ta'ala, is the one who places that fear in the hearts of the enemies. It's not from me or you. So it's not just about numbers. But it's come superficial with some of the people. So yes, fulfilling the rights of Allah Azza wa Jal. Yes, the salawat for the men in the masjid. Yes, when you're able. If you're working and you can't go, la bas tayyib. Barakallah feek. Some people, they're driving, they're a plumber, they can't make it to the masjid in time. No problem. Pray your prayer. Alhamdulillah. The religion is ease. But we're talking about for those who are able. Our children. The Salaf, they said, La tazalu hadil ummah bi khair. This nation will continue to be in a state of good as long as their children, they learn the Quran. Ma ta'allama wil darum al Quran. The children should be raised in the masjid. Boys should be learning Quran, girls should be learning Quran, even for school, when they go to school. Because as I mentioned in Cardiff, when the children, our children, they go to school, they're going to come into contact with un-Islamic theories, Big Bang theory, Darwinism, and other than that. They need Islamic knowledge to repel it. The masjid is the foundation of our community. The masjid. Because that's where the tarbiyah is going to take place. We have to have knowledge. As we see in this narration, look, Hamdara. He met Abu Bakr. They both had the same idea with regards to hypocrisy. They feared hypocrisy of action for themselves. Where did they go? They went to the Messenger of Allah 
knowledge العلم قبل القول والعمل knowledge comes before speech and action and the prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام he repeated to this this thing to حنظلة ثلاث مرات ساعة وساعة three times ساعة وساعة ساعة وساعة sometimes we repeat things we should never get bored that's a way of learning we need to hear things more than once the reminder benefits the believer so brothers and sisters from this narration and when you find it in Sahih Muslim in the chapter Babu Fadli Dhikri Wal Fikri Fi Umuri Al Akhirah Wal Muraqaba Wa Jawazi Tarki Dalika Fi Ba'd Al Awqat Wal Istighal Bid Dunya In the chapter The Excellence of Continuously Remembering Allah Azza wa Jal Likewise Thinking about the, the Hereafter Yes we should think about the Hereafter Our gatherings we should remind one, one another about the hereafter. When we go out in the street, it doesn't matter who we're talking to, remind them about the hereafter. Whichever. You come across a person, they're selling drugs, for example. Ya akhi, if they're Muslim, fear Allah Azza wa Jal. Do you know the punishment for khamar is kada? This is the punishment for, for drugs. It's not going to bring you any prosperity. You're destroying people's lives. If you're in a Muslim country, this would be the recompense for those who are involved in this. Fear Allah Azza wa Jal. Fear the fire and the punishment of Allah. Naam. Our da'wah wherever we are is قال الله قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم That's one of the clearest signs of the people of the sunnah. When we talk about the religion, Allah said, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, as we benefit from this hadith. Ikhwan, a lot more could be said. Alhamdulillah. I think the prayer is approaching. I'll stop there inshallah. If anyone has any questions. Barakallah feekum. Jazakum Allah khair. Maybe we could take one or two. And again, anything that I said which was correct from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan and Allah Azza wa Jalla and his messenger are free from that. Now, I mean, there's no paper. If anyone has their hand raised, tafadda. Advice to someone who lived a life, a long life of sin, but wants to now start practicing. My advice to them is that what Allah Azza wa Jalla said, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهِ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوا لِذَنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَمْ يُسِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ Whoever, Allah Azza wa Jal, the meaning being, Allah said, the meaning being, whoever commits immoral, indecent acts, and then they remember Allah Azza wa Jal, they remember Allah, and they ask Allah, they seek forgiveness for their sins. They repent to Allah sincerely. And who forgives sins except for Allah? And they don't continue upon this disobedience while they know. Allah has just said that these individuals, for them is the forgiveness of Allah in paradise. Doesn't matter what sin you've committed. Allah is al-ghafoor al-rahim. He is the forgiving, the most merciful. Don't let anyone make you think that you can't repent. You repent to Allah sincerely. You do not know how Allah may raise you in the dunya and the akhirah. I said, we're not defined by our past. What matters is now, what are we doing now? Repent to Allah immediately. Because after you repent, alhamdulillah, The one who repents from a sin is like the one who has no sins. You repent, it's like the one who has no sins. Look, Allah mentioned in that verse, fahisha, fornication, those who fornicate. It's a major sin. Min al kabair, filthy. But what? Should they despair of the mercy of Allah and say there's no way back? No. He said they remember Allah and they seek forgiveness for their sins. They repent to Allah. If you repent to Allah sincerely, Allah has yell, Inna Allah yaghfiru dunuba jami'a. Allah forgives all sins. Who are we? No one can prevent you from repentance. Alhamdulillah, our religion is so beautiful. To repent, you don't have to go to no one, no created being, no human being. You don't have to go, you know, I need you to intercede. That's nonsense. That's Catholicism. That's not Islam. Or I'm going to the Imam and I have to tell him my sins. You don't tell anyone your sins. You turn to Allah and beg his forgiveness. If your sin is private, you conceal it and you turn to him, tabarak wa ta'ala, and you beg his forgiveness. When Adam, alayhi salatu was salam, and his wife, they ate from the tree, what did they say? Rabbana zalamna anfusana. They said, our Lord, we wronged ourselves. رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِن لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنُكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ 
our Lord, we have wronged ourselves. If you do not forgive us and have mercy upon us, we will be from the losers. Allah elevated Adam. Adam was elevated in degree after he made tawbah. Look, he repented, Allah raised him in degree. We find in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi he said, Law lam tuthnibu, if you didn't sin, Allah would do away with you and he would come with the people that sin so that he could forgive them. Allah hates sins and disobedience. What does that mean? He loves to forgive the servant if they sin. Allah hates sins. He hates disobedience. But if we sin, he loves for us to forgive. Uh, he loves for us, Afwan, to repent and seek his forgiveness. So again, Ikhwan, our, your, the role of us is what? If someone's falling short, encourage them to repent. The man at the time of the Prophet ﷺ was drinking alcohol. After he was punished, some of the people, they started to curse him. The Prophet said, don't aid the shaitan against your brother. Do you not know that he loves Allah and his messenger? Because no doubt, whoever, man tab, tab Allah Ali. Whoever repents, Allah will accept their repentance. Look, if we want to know even how to deal with people who have shortcomings and sins, the best guidance is, the best speech is the speech of Allah. The best guidance is the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ. Yes, no doubt, you see somebody drinking or smoking marijuana, you're going to say, fear Allah, what are you doing? You're not going to turn a blind eye. Taqillah. Whoever it is. If you, if, for example, if you know them, nah, man, they're a Muslim, a relative, or whoever, or somebody that you know, Taqillah, what are you doing, brother? Fear Allah. You're not going to condone it, but at the same time, yes, give them down. What are you doing? Fear Allah. Some people say, you know what? I'm not going to talk to them. You know, they, that's, you know they, they're gone. Too far gone. They're wasted. You know, I'm not even going to address them. How, maybe your word might cause him to go home and reflect. You never know. Or it... It might not accomplish all of what you desire, but it might limit it, the, the harm and the evil. And you don't know who Allah is going to guide. There's a question here. What is your advice to, for new Muslims with a difficult non-Muslim parent? Again, alhamdulillah, my advice, when I answered this in the Telegram group that we have with, for reminders and questions and answers, I answered it for a brother in Nigeria, and the answer is the same. My advice, again, study the Quran, the Sunnah, the biography, the biography of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, the biographies of the companions. These questions are dealt with. What is your advice for new Muslims with difficult non-Muslim parents? My advice, look at the companions and what they went through. They went through the same things. You know, even a shad, even worse than what we experience. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, radiallahu an, the story of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, his mother... She said, I'm not going to speak to you ever until you abandon your religion. She said, I'm not going to eat or drink. She took an oath. She, swore. she took an oath and she swore, I'm not going to speak to you until you renounce your religion, until you abandon your religion. That's Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu. Sa'ad, he was patient, no doubt, because... Obedience to the creation, even if it's your mother and father, is only in that which is lawful. And Allah revealed the verse, when jahadaka, and if they try and compel you to associate partners with me, that which you have no knowledge, فَلَا تُتِعْهُمَا Don't obey them in that. وَصَاحِبْهُمَ فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفَ As well, a similar verse. Ayatan, two similar verses, accompany them in this world in the best fashion. So Sa'ad, he didn't obey her in, relieve, in leaving the religion. If your parents tell you to do shirk, you don't listen to them. If they say, you know, go to the Brevi Masjid and they call upon the Prophet ﷺ, we don't obey them. If they say, practice the Mawlid, we don't obey them. If they tell you to do anything Muharram, we don't obey them. If drink alcohol, that's why, Ikhwan, this issue when it comes up about, you know, obedience to the rulers in that which is lawful. Ahl Sunnah, the scholars, based upon ayat of the Quran, based upon ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet, many ahadith, there's chapters in the books of hadith, Ijma' of the Salaf. When Ahl Sunnah say obedience to the rulers, it's only in that which is lawful. If the ruler tells you to do something haram, you don't obey them in that particular phase. Only in that which the Muslim ruler tells you and it's allowed for you to do. So I don't know where these other people go off on these tangents. You know, with the emotions and the emotional speech. Obedience is in what, what's lawful. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu an, he didn't obey his mother when she tried to have him reject the religion. He was patient upon the command of Allah Azza wa and Allah made it easy for him. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, his mother insulted the Prophet ﷺ. He was crying. 
Imagine that, insulting the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, his mother. Abu Huraira was in tears. He went to the Prophet, he asked the Prophet to make dua for Allah to guide his mother. When he went back to his mother, his mother embraced Islam. Story after story. Islam is balanced. Your parents are not a Muslim, but they're your parent. Your mother, your father, you're going to love them. Mahabbat tabi'iyan. Innate natural love. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. You naturally, you love your mother, your father. That's natural. That's permissible. What is not allowed is Mahabbat dini. You can't love them on account of the religion. But natural love is jais. Allah said to the Prophet, you cannot guide those whom you love. Some of the ulama of tafsir, they say he's talking about his uncle Abu Talib who died upon disbelief. So mahabbat tabi'i, la bas. So you naturally love your parents, but still obedience is, is, is to your parents is only in what is lawful. They tell you to do something that is impermissible. Shirk is the gravest of all sins. Any other bid'ah, yani muharramat, you don't obey them in that. However, look, there's a middle path. Not like the extremists. Oh, for your, your parents are kuffar, you should abandon them and leave them. No. You honor them in that which is just and that which is fair and that which is allowed. And you deal with them, honoring them and respecting them. Look at the balance. Islam is balanced. No, ex no exaggeration, no falling short. It's based on revelation and it makes sense logically. Not like these, anyone tell you, abandon your parent. You know, cut them off because they're not a Muslim. That's ghulu. We don't find that in the Quran. In the Quran, yes. If they compel you or if they strive to force you to commit shirk, you don't obey them in that. However, in the dunya, in worldly affairs, you accompany them in a better way. That's da'wah. Maybe Allah will guide them. You never know. Make dua for them. May Allah, make dua that Allah guides them. You don't know what's written for them. Naam. And you, you're patient. This is a test and a trial. Alif la meem. Ahasib al nas. An yutrakum. An yakulu amanna. Wa hum la yuftanun. Do the people think that they're going to be left to say we believe and they're not going to be trialed and tested? We're going to be tested. We're going to be tested. That's your test. May Allah make it easy for you. Everyone, all of us, we have tests in different ways. Every, we're all going. Life is a test. Life is a test to see who is best in action. It, people's tests are different. And when Allah tests you, He tests an individual ala qadri dini, based upon the strength of a person's religion. Allah doesn't test us with something that we can't get over. Anything, any trial, any test, يُبْتَلَ الرَّجُلْ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ دِينِهِ We find in the hadith, Allah, a person will be tested according to the strength of their religion. Any test that you have, you can get past it if you seek aid of Allah and you adhere to what is correct in the Quran and the Sunnah. May Allah make it easy for you and grant you success. I'll close with this advice to the youth and others with regards to social media and the it's evils and dangers. I mean, social, I've, I have lectures in detail about social media. However, like the scholars said, social media is a double-edged sword. It's beneficial, but also it, it can be harmful. Use it for what is beneficial, stay away from what is harmful. Ikhwan, use it for what is beneficial, stay away from what is harmful. With regards to social media, don't be fooled by everything that you see on social media. It's the new Hollywood. Before, you know, to be in a movie, you have to go to Hollywood now. Instagram is the Hollywood for everyone. You can be a, a no one and you're acting like it's Hollywood. It's not real. It's not the real world. Some people, you see them on Instagram, you think, wow, this guy's a millionaire. MashaAllah, Allah mabarak alik. You meet them, I don't have any money. This person, MashaAllah, courageous. You meet them, it's not the case. So many people pretending. Don't be fooled by it. What people are showing you on social media, listen, the one who's content don't have to go on social media and tell everyone their life. And anyway, why would you go on there and tell them about things? The evil eye is true. You go on there telling people, you know, look at my watch. That watch might not last for another day. Allah knows best. People ripping off Rolexes from people's arms. And you're on the internet flashing. If, you, if you're happy with your watch, keep it, keep, it, keep it private. Why are you showing the world all of these affairs? Certain things benefits. Labas. You're traveling, alhamdulillah, labas. But life is not... There was a case in America, and I mentioned it, and I'll close with this. There was a woman. This is, this is what made me realize. Obviously, I, I, from meeting people and just life... And the limited experience I have, I know that a lot of people pretend on social media. But when I read, I, I saw a story. There was a woman, she had a YouTube channel about raising children. Telling people how to raise children. You know, how to be a good parent. She's being prosecuted for, you know, for maltreatment of her own children. But she's on YouTube telling people, this is how you're a good mother. This is how you raise your children. This is how you educate your children. And she's being prosecuted for her treatment of her own kids. Imagine the level of mistreatment to be prosecuted. But she's behind the camera. Somebody watching might say, that's the best parent in the world.
May Allah grant us all success. Listen, this dunya, the dunya is mal'oon, mal'oon, ma fiha, illa dhikrullah. Except for the remembrance of Allah. Again, not saying, Ikhwan, Allah wants us to be happy and enjoy our life, and we can enjoy it. We can enjoy it. But in order to enjoy it, you need iman, you need righteous deeds, you need to stay away from what is going to harm you. As I said, as it relates to your iman, as it relates to your intellect, as it relates to your soul. And alhamdulillah, the beauty of Islam, sometimes, you know, you, a person may think, oh, you know, I can't do this, I can't do that. You don't look at how Islam, how Allah has legislated things to protect you. How many of us think, I, I, alhamdulillah, it's a blessing. Like I said, me personally, I go back to the inner city, grew up in the inner city. I'm happy, walillah, alhamd. I see people I grew up with, they wanted to sell drugs. I see the condition that they're in. I see people my age, in their mid-40s, missing teeth, no teeth. They look like they're in their 90s. I go with my son sometimes, and the, my sons will be like, they'll be like, he's a, uh, that person, he's younger than you. He looks like he's 80. But why? Alhamdulillah, the Muslim is blessed. There's no better way to live. If you're young, believe it. When your father's telling you, fear Allah, go to the masjid, learn Quran, work hard in school, I'm telling you your father is right. Your father, your mother, they're right. Work hard in what's beneficial. Yes, religion and also dunya. Work hard. La bats tayyib. Whatever you're doing, do it properly. In Allah katbil ihsan ala kulli shay. But you're going to need religion for whatever you do. That's the way you enjoy this world. But the most important thing and the ultimate thing, that is the way by iman and righteous deeds that a person will enter Jannah. There's no paradise for the one with no iman. That is why even people who do good and they don't have iman, Allah says about the people what, who do good deeds and they don't have iman. He said, أَذْهَبْتُمْ طَيِّبَاتِكُمْ فِي حَيَاتِكُمْ الدُّنْيَا وَاسْتَمْتَعْتُمْ بِهَا He said, you enjoy whatever good you did, you enjoyed it in this world. It's gone. There's no good deeds in the akhirah for the one with no iman. They don't have any good. Anything that appeared to be good, they will be, receive the recompense in this world. يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ No good. They will not enter paradise. The one without iman, they will not enter paradise until the camel goes through the eye of the needle. And that will never happen. Impossible. The religion is a blessing. Again, Ikhwan, we fear Allah, it's for us. If a person disobeys Allah, they're only harming themselves. You will never harm Allah. Allah doesn't need any one of us. Doesn't need the best of us. As we find in the hadith, Qudsi, لَوْ أَنَّ أَوَّلَكُمْ وَآخِرَكُمْ وَإِنْسَكُمْ وَجِنَّكُمْ كَانُوا عَلَىٰ أَتْقَ قَلْبِ رَجُلٍ وَاحِدٍ مِنْكُمْ Allah said, if the first of you and the last of you, the human of you and the jinn of you, you all had the most pious of hearts. You were all the most righteous of people. That wouldn't increase the dominion of Allah in the slightest. We benefit. So when you look at you praying, you benefit. You fasting, you benefit. Naam. You giving charity, you benefit. Allah doesn't benefit from those righteous deeds. It's for our benefit. And that's why when you look at the maqasid of the sharia, the objectives of, of Islamic law, it's for the benefit of mankind. Allah doesn't benefit. If everyone disbelieved, in takfuru antum wa man fil ardi jami'a. If you were to disbelieve and, and every single person on the face of the earth, Allah is still the all rich, the one deserving of all praise. Allah is still al ghani. If every person said, disbelieved and said, I don't believe, Allah is still al ghani. He still remains the all rich. Doesn't remove anything from his dominion. May Allah grant us all firmness. May Allah grant us all sincerity. May Allah forgive us for our sins. And may Allah Azawajal make us truly brothers to one another. Ikhwan, your brother is not your enemy. Your brother is your friend. You love him for the sake of Allah Azawajal. We're here to try and aid one another in pleasing Allah. And remember that. We want to try and help people. We don't want to help destroy them. We're here to help one another. If we want the non-Muslim to be guided, what about our brothers and sisters? We got work to do. And like Sheikh Mubil used to say, the people who are most qualified for this are Ahl Sunnah. No doubt. Ahl Sunnah are the most qualified. We have work to do for ourselves but we got work to do in our communities. We have children. Some of our children getting caught in the streets. Some of them selling drugs. We need to be out there in the streets giving dawah. Everyone has a role. We can't just afford to just stay in the masjid and pretend like there's no world out there. We all have a role. There's a responsibility and a duty. When we arise with that, we'll see the barakah. Wa subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilik. Wa jazakum la khairan. And again, I thank the brothers from the admin of the masjid and likewise the community for your good thoughts and may Allah forgive us all for our shortcomings.